So just a quick outline. Uh, I'm going to start off by uh, kind of thinking about how we can, we can kind of uh, think about systems of smart contracts and how to kind of visualize them uh, so that we can kind of construct, think about uh, these systems in kind of like a component-based way. Uh, then we're going to talk about the motivation for cross-blockchain governance. We're going to talk about how we can model systems of Ethereum smart contracts. And then we're going to go into the details of how we can create a meta model. OK, so we're going to be looking at many different diagrams in this presentation. Just about every slide has a diagram in it. Uh, so these diagrams are, are showing you a snapshot of the global state uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. Or, or a blockchain or shard. And the components that can exist within uh, the, these virtual machines, we have two different components. We have uh, externally owned accounts, uh, which are, you know, they have a public and private key pair associated with them. Uh, and these are like typical wallets. Then we have smart contracts, which are going to be represented by these gray rectangles. Uh, and then we're, we're going to represent systems of smart contracts that might have many different components as uh, just gray rectangles with a thick outline. Uh, and then uh, interactions between these di different components are, are shown as arrows that are directed from the caller to the callee. So smart contracts can call into another smart contract. That's, we're going to represent that with an arrow. Uh, so how can we think about a governance system in kind of the highest level, most generic way? Uh, so we have a set of inputs. Uh, these inputs are fed into some arbitrary governance system. Uh, you know, the inputs could be you know, votes that are associated with on-chain identities. They could be token votes. They could be reputation. They could be anything. And the governance system could also be very complex and nuanced. Uh, we're going to represent it as just an arbitrary kind of black box. And then the governance system is controlling some sort of stateful system of smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and the stateful system can, it can be any arbitrary system. But for the purposes of this presentation, it's much easier to think about uh, meta models and kind of this approach we're going to be talking about if we focus on a specific example. Uh, and so the specific example that we're going to focus on is 0x because kind of more familiar with that than most other systems. Uh, and so the 0x protocol is a uh, system that is used to facilitate the peer-to-peer -peer exchange of digital assets on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and it is a stateful system that is governed. Uh, and at a high level, you can think of it as having a governance token. It's an ERC-20 token. And this to these token balances are used to control a governance system. And it could be any arbitrary system. And then we have this canonical system of smart contracts that is actually facilitating the exchange of digital assets. So let's zoom in on the 0x pipeline and kind of see what's inside that black box. And uh, as you can see on the right, we have uh, a number of different Ethereum contracts that are all kind of interacting with each other. And you, you, can, think of, you can think of this system as a pipeline. Uh, a modular pipeline that's broken into different segments. And governance allows us to add, remove, or replace these modules from the pipeline. Uh, and don't want to get into the lower level details of 0x, because that's not really the focus of this presentation. But at a high level, you can think of uh, how 0x works as this pipeline, uh, these cryptographically signed orders, which kind of signal your intent to enter into a trade. These chunks of data enter on the left side into the exchange contract. Uh, and then you know, a, sequence, a cascade of function calls kind of go down the pipeline. And then users' balances are modified at the right side of the pipeline. OK. So we created 0x protocol on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, we started working on 0x almost uh, actually over two years ago at this point. And uh, in the subse subsequent 12 months, a number of different EVM blockchains started to emerge. Uh, and you know, we wanted to build this system that would allow you to exchange anything of value. Uh, and so you know, we, we're, we're thinking about 
how can we take 0x and make it work on other blockchains as well? And so kind of the, the most naive approach is to just take this entire system, the governance token, the governance system, and then this pipeline, and just kind of copy and paste it onto every single blockchain. And the, the problem with this approach is that you end up with numerous different governance systems that exist in parallel, and, and this creates additional coordination costs. And if you have different governance systems, uh, it's very likely that these governance systems may choose to go in different directions. Uh, so you, what, what you end up with are kind of these incompatible forks or different versions of this pipeline, and that creates an inconsistent user or developer experience. And if you have all of these different versions of the pipeline, you also have to, it, it creates duplicated effort because you have to have a different developer team maintaining all of these different copies. So this was kind of the initial motivation for, for thinking about cross-blockchain governance. But then, you know, when it became clear that sharding is, is the direction that the space is going, it became much more urgent that we start thinking about uh, how we can build these cross-blockchain governance systems. And, the, you know, the reason is because we're building all of these, these systems on the Ethereum blockchain today, uh, but when we move to shard, a sharded version of Ethereum, everything's going to break. Uh, and all of all the ways that we've been thinking about building dApps are going to have to change. Uh, so, so the problem we face when we move to a sharded blockchain, uh, do we want to have this canonical system of smart contracts, this is 0x pipeline, exist on a single shard and kind of force people to move their assets onto that shard? I don't think that makes sense. Uh, I believe that in order to have like, a truly decentralized blockchain, we're going to have to have like, some basic infrastructure that's available on every single shard. Uh, otherwise, all of the dApps are going to want to co-locate on just one or two shards, and that kind of brings us right back to where we are today. Uh, so do we want to have, you know, do we want to have, cop do we want to copy and paste 0x on all these different shards? It's the same exact problem as uh, the, the problem we face with multiple blockchains. No, it doesn't make sense. Uh, we we want to have a single governance system that allows every single shard to have an up, a, a copy of this pipeline that is uh, synchronized and uh, consistent. Okay, so. How can we build a system that allows every shard to receive updates and to be, consistent, to be consistent with a single kind of model that we want uh, them all to follow? And I think it, this kind of leads to an overarching question of how, you know, how are we going to be designing dApps on sharded blockchains? We're going to have to move from a pattern of creating these kind of singleton infrastructure contracts that everyone uses. And we're going to have to move to a model where we really have these kind of drop-in modules that you know, are loc you know, exist on all of these different shards in parallel. So this uh, presentation is going to focus on how we can build one of these systems. So at a high level, the meta model is just a couple of extra layers that we add to our generic governance system. Uh, so we kind of taking this same approach that we started off with. We have a shard, and on that shard, we have a number of different components. We have a governance token, and this governance token is controlling a governance system. And then this governance system is controlling what we're going to call a meta model. And this meta model describes a system of smart contracts in a way that is agnostic to any particular shard or blockchain uh, and can be generalized to any of them. Then we have what we're calling a dispatcher. And a dispatcher uh, looks at the meta model. Anytime the meta model is changed, it translates that generalized model, uh, the changes to that generalized model, into the context of the local shard or blockchain that that dispatcher is located on. Once it has translated those changes into the local address space, then it applies those changes to the stateful system of smart contracts, uh, and that's how we kind of have uh, 
uh, synchronization of all these stateful systems across different shards or blockchains. We're going to create a meta model, but before we can create a meta model, we kind of have to have just a basic model of the system of smart contracts that we want to uh, focus on. So, every, you know, and, and we can do this by basically focusing on each individual component within the system uh, in isolation. So, every single smart contract basically has some basic things associated with it. It has an Ethereum address. It has some bytecode, which describes how it works, what, it, what does the code actually do. And then it has some internal state. And for, the, you know, for 0x, the only internal state that we're really concerned with are these access controls between different contracts. Uh, so each contract within the 0x pipeline, it has an internal list of Ethereum addresses and it, from which it is willing to accept incoming calls. And so we have this model. We have these kind of three chunks of data associated with each contract. And the problem it, with our model is that it, it, it's only valid for one specific shard. And the reason why is because Ethereum contract addresses are derived from the contract creator's address and the nonce associated with, with that address. Uh, so kind of putting it in more plain English, we take this contract and we deploy it to shards A and shard, and shard B. The contract is identical on either, uh, on either shard. It has the same exact bytecode, but the contract addresses are different on either shard. Uh, and so on the right, you can see a diagram. Uh, we, let's say we want to add a new contract to our pipeline called exchange version 3. And we want to we point all of the other contracts in the system to exchange version 3 to know that it's safe to accept incoming calls from this contract. Well, that works just fine for shard A, uh, but the address of exchange version 3 is different on shard B. Uh, so all of these contracts will be looking at a location on the blockchain where nothing exists. So if we want to create a meta model or a model that is shard agnostic, contracts can't identify themselves or each other by address. Okay, so how do we make our model meta? We move from address space of the local shard or blockchain to what I'm calling code hash space. Uh, and so the code hash is a unique identifier that's derived from a contract's compiled source code. So in the image here, you, you can see on the left we have some Solidity source code. We're just going to write a smart contract. We're going to compile that source code, and we're going to get bytecode. And it's just a blob of data uh, that describes how the contract functions within the EVM. And then we're going to take that bytecode and we're going to hash it. And we're going to end up with a 32-byte hash that is called the code hash. And so if we take the same exact contract, we deploy it on a bunch of different shards, or a bunch of different blockchains for that matter, and we use the same compiler, we use the same hashing function, it'll have the same exact code hash on every single shard of blockchain. And so EIP-1152 introduces a new opcode called Xcode hash that allows contracts to easily inspect the code hash of other contracts. And so this is an important point. Uh, EIP-1152, I believe, is supposed to be included in Constantinople. OK, so we have code hash. Now, how do we use this to create a meta model? What, is a, what does a meta model actually look like? The meta model is just an Ethereum smart contract, and it does a couple of very simple things. It accepts instructions from our governance system. It stores a list of code hash indexed contracts. So we have components within our stateful system. It just stores them as code hashes. It identifies them as code hashes. And then it, it stores the access permissions between these different code hashes. And that's all it does. So you can see on the right, we have this model that we created of the 0x pipeline. We're looking at each smart contract individually, and there is this information associated with each one. And we're going to move from this model to a meta model, where we, we basically just have these code hashes that are linked to each other.
And it's important to note that this meta model will be valid for every single shard or blockchain. OK, so what are dispatchers and how do dispatchers work? So dispatchers are also just Ethereum smart contracts. But what they do is they translate these code hashes from code hash space back into the local address space of the shard or blockchain that they are located on. Uh, and so one problem here. It's very easy for smart contracts to inspect the code hash of a known address. So if I, if I say, what's the code hash of this address right here, it can do that. But if we give a smart contract a code hash, it doesn't know where to find the contract associated with it. So we have to tell the dispatcher, you know, this is exchange version 3, and this is the bytecode associated with it. And it will verify that that's true, and it will add it into its own internal model, local model. Uh, so again, the dispatcher just it's a single smart contract. There's one replica of it on every single chain. And it stores a list of the different components within the system. Uh, and it maps from their code hash to their address uh, on the local chain. And it also stores these access permissions between these code hash indexed uh, contracts. Or I guess in this, it, it maps from one address to another address uh, to show access permissions. And then finally, it applies updates. So anytime the meta model is changed, it sees that the meta model has changed, and it, it changes its own internal model. And then it applies that to the actual stateful system. So it actually calls into the stateful system to to modify it so that it's consistent with the meta model. So how does the dispatcher uh, dispatch these updates? So uh, it's just a function call. Uh, so yeah, if, you, if you're going to register a new, kind of a new contract address with the dispatcher, so we've added exchange version 3 to the meta model, and now we want to add version, exchange version 3 to our local dispatcher. Uh, you know, it basically is just going to verify that the code hash is consistent with the meta model. And then once it knows that, it will just call into the associated contract within, within the pipeline and, and uh, make those updates as well. So I, I guess like a, a clear explanation is, is shown on the right. So we have this dispatcher. It's a smart contract. It has this internal model of how this 0x pipeline should should look how it's laid out on shard A. And then if we want to add exchange version 3 and we want to tell you know, this contract called ERC20 proxy to accept calls from exchange version 3, then basically the dispatcher, once its, once its uh, internal model is updated, it will actually just call into ERC20 proxy, and it will update its internal access controls to accept calls from exchange version 3. So that was a lot. There was a lot of stuff going on there. But if we put it all together, we started out with this kind of very simple uh, diagram that shows these big chunks and how they're uh, associated with each other. And if we kind of look back at what we've covered so far and we kind of zoom in on each of the pieces, the meta model is just a single smart contract that exists on the same chain as the governance system. And it has this internal shard or blockchain agnostic meta model stored within. The dispatcher contract, there's one on every single shard or blockchain. And it also has an internal model. Uh, but it's taking the generalized version, and it's translating that into the local address space. And then it is dispatching those, those updates onto the actual pipeline or stateful system. OK. so. On the right, you can kind of get even a more zoomed out picture of how this might look. So let's imagine that it's, you know, Ethereum 2.0 is here today. We have the beacon chain. Underneath it, we have all these shards. And we have one of the shards that has a governance token, a governance system, and a meta model. And all of the shards have a dispatcher that receives updates from the meta model translates those updates into the local address space, and then applies those updates to its local stateful system. Uh, so there are, are certainly some constraints 
uh, around when and where these, this kind of framework can be applied. So, you know, we have to have the same exact virtual machine running on any shard or blockchain that wants to have this kind of metamodel approach. We must be able to, pr uh, more generally, we must be able to prove to a dispatcher contract that the metamodel has changed. So with a sharded blockchain, uh, with homogeneous shards, it's pretty simple. All of the shards have the same exact virtual machine. Uh, and you know, proving to the dispatcher that the metamodel has changed is really just an asynchronous cross-shard call. So it's pretty straightforward. But metamodels can also be applied pretty more or less easily for different blockchains that operate under a shared security model. Uh, so you can think of you know, different EVM blockchains that might exist uh, in Polkadot network. It gets a little bit harder to prove to a dispatcher that the metamodel has changed. If we're talking about uh, blockchains that have their own uh, security models and proving you know, that the metamodel on one blockchain has changed to the dispatcher that exists on a different blockchain and they have separate security models. It, uh, it can be done though. It's probably gonna be easier to prove for blockchains that have fast finality. But if we wanna have a meta model that dispatches updates to blockchains with probabilistic finality, uh, we could take an approach similar to BTC Relay, but it's very expensive. Uh, you know, the Ethereum blockchain for BTC Relay, the, the Ethereum blockchain basically has to be running a light client of the Bitcoin blockchain in order to verify that a, a transaction has occurred on the Bitcoin blockchain. So it's pretty heavy. And there might be a way to use recursive snarks uh, to more efficiently prove to a smart contract on Ethereum that something has occurred in a completely separate blockchain. Uh, and so Coda Protocol is kind of leading the charge on recursive snarks. Uh, and I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, so this is just kind of, th this is kind of what I have for this presentation today. Uh, but yeah, I just wanna thank the Aragon team again for letting me speak here and thank you for coming to see a uh, presentation so early in the day. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanna note that uh, the Xerox team is hiring. Uh, we just recently got a small office space in Fullnode and we're looking to get some uh, you know, passionate developers to join us here and in San Francisco. So uh, you can see the roles that we have open on, on our website, zerox.org. So thank you.